evening, ladies and gentlemen. If this is your first lightning talk session, we just need to explain the rules. E each speaker has five minutes and no more than that. When they have 10 seconds remaining, I will appear. And at that point, you need to start clapping with two fingers. If they run out of time altogether, the signal will be obvious and we'd like you to begin a round of applause and that will politely tell the speaker that their time is up. Our first speaker this evening <laughs> is Alice and she'd like to talk to us about hypothesis. So, Alice, all yours. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about a library that I discovered a few months ago and I think is amazing. Um, called Hypothesis, and it's basically a library for writing smarter unit tests. Um, so it helps catch edge cases, which are normally where your code tends to break. So for me, it, I've just found it so useful. Um, a little disclaimer here, so I'm new to this, but as was pointed out to me about two hours ago, the author of this package is actually in the audience. So <laughs> thank you so much. This is an amazing package. I love it. Um, okay. So I'm just going to walk you through a few examples to show how great it is. Um, so we're going to start with a really, really stupid function. Um, so I'm going to take an integer n, and I'm going to square it by adding it to itself n times. Um, so let's run that. Then I'm going to test to see whether this function works. So I'm going to try 0, squaring 0, see if that's 0. I'm going to square a random number, so 256, see if that works. I'm going to square a million, see if that works. I run that. And I get no output, so that shows that that test has hopefully worked. If I change that number and run it again, then again, the assertion error. So just to show that that assert is hopefully catching errors. Um, however, if I try and improve this test, so I think I've maybe caught all the edge cases. Um, if I try and improve this, um, then I'll use hypothesis. So I'm going to instead put this decorator in front. So I'm going to check all the integers between plus or minus in a million, um, and then run that. And then if I run this test, then I get a falsifying example. So it has told me that my function has failed for minus one. Because um, if we look at the stupid way that I implemented it, um, it's got a range function in. And if you have a range of a minus number, you're not going to get any iteration. So stupid function, and hypothesis has called it for me. Hooray. Um, OK, it can do some other cool stuff in there. So maybe that I know that, um, OK, so I'm going to change my limits. I know it doesn't work for minus numbers. But say I only want to check that it works for even numbers. So I stick a little assume function in here. So I'm going to assume that the uh, modular division of this is 0, a modular division by 2 even. And then I'm going to run it. and. Loads, loads, loads. Um, and hopefully it's going to show you that this test passes. Hooray, it passes. So my function works on positive even numbers. Cool. Um, so another thing it can do, which I think is quite cool, is it can find things for you. So I'm going to try and find uh, what's called a Pythagorean triple. So it's basically a list of three numbers. So here, a list of three numbers. Um, and the sum of their squares, uh, the sum of the square of the first two numbers is equal to the square of the third number. Um, and I've only chose to do it b between a really small interval, but obviously this is a really stupid example. Um, but yeah, it's quite powerful. It's quite cool, I think. Um, okay, so finish. Um, this is, you can just pip install this um, to catch all those pesky edge cases, cases in a much more efficient way. And I recommend checking out the docs for a much better explanation of this. Um, so thank you for listening. And the second speaker for today is Razvan, and he will talk about Alzheimer's Prediction Challenge. So, hello, everyone. I don't have any slides. Um, I want to start with a question. So how many of you are working with medical data? Quite a few hands. All right. Um, can you all hear me? OK, so, uh, so on Sunday, we're going to organize a challenge. Uh, and I invite all of you to come and participate. Uh, well, we're going to predict the evolution of uh, Alzheimer's disease patients. 
So more precisely, we're gonna, uh, yeah, uh, we're gonna use loads of data from these patients, genetic data, imaging data, to predict how the evolution will, will go over the next five years. Um, why do we do that? Because uh, we, um, by, by breaking the evolution, we can help develop drugs uh, for these patients to treat dementia. And um, you're free to use any model you want, regression methods, uh, machine learning, your networks, anything, absolutely anything. We have prices, um, and if you decide, we're actually organizing a, a much bigger competition outside the, cha the, the conference uh, where we offer 30,000 uh, pounds prices. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's on a Sunday at 2 p.m. Uh, yeah, in uh, room L, um, do come and, uh, yeah, and join uh, our hackathon. Yeah, and uh, we can make teams, work together, and uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Marek, who's going to tell us all about PyCon Slovakia. Thank you, Marek. So, hi, PyCon UK. I'm Marek, and I'm from Slovakia. For those of you who don't know, this is Slovakia on a map. As you can see, we are in Central Europe. We are in the European Union, and we have no intention of leaving anytime soon. <laughs> Our currency is zero, we have one of the most stunning mountain ranges called the High Tatras, and we make really good beer, and it's really cheap as well. So what else do we have? Well, there's one other thing I haven't told you about me. I'm a member of the Slack Python user group, or SPY for short. You can imagine all the looks I get when I mention the organization I'm from. We, the Slovak Python user group, together with the rest of the Python community in Slovakia, organized the annual uh, PyCon, which will be, uh, and the next one will be in March 2018. So what is PyCon Slovakia? First and foremost, is a, it's a community conference, and we really do our best to make it as warm and friendly as we can. Each year we hold talks both in Slovak and English language. It is a three-day conference consisting of talks, workshops, and sprints. And even though Slovakia is a small nation, our conference has been quite successful with over 500 attendees and 50 speakers last year. Uh, on our first PyCon in 2016, one of our speakers was Nicholas Tolliday. Are you here? Hi. Not only it was probably the first time a BBC microbit landed on Slovak soil, uh, way before the official release, uh, he also gave us a homework, and our homework we did. Uh, and so we organized the first educational track this spring, and up to our knowledge, it's the second oldest educational track in Europe, right after the UK one. But what is the special relationship between PyCon UK and PyCon Slovakia? Well, it turns out that our chairman, Richard, attended PyCon UK in 2015 and gave a lightning talk. In that short talk, he invited everyone to PyCon Slovakia, and that, ladies and gentlemen, was historically the first announcement of a PyCon Slovakia ha ever happening. You're welcome. <laughs> so, on behalf of all the organizers, volunteers, and the Slovak Python community, I would like to invite you to PyCon Slovakia 2018. If you think that attending is a good idea, and believe me, you should, visit uh, www.pycon.sk and grab a ticket. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. And our next speaker, please welcome Gail. Yep. And Gail is going to talk to us about In Praise of Socks. A big applause, please. <laughs> Once upon a time, a long time ago, and far, far away. Oh, hang on, no, if you were listening to me last year, you'll know not to take fairy stories entirely at face value like that. So let's get down to the details a bit more. When I say a long time ago, I mean the 1990s. And when I say a land far, far away, I actually mean the Isle of Wight. <laughs> and the story I'm going to talk to you about is a story about being a woman in tech, which is something I never do. I'm breaking my rule doing that today, but it's a maximum of five minutes, so we'll break the rule, don't tell anyone, okay? So, my story is about radar projects that I was working on, on the Isle of Wight. And at the end of a project, there was a commemorative memor bit of memorabilia for people who'd worked on the project. And it was always a necktie. Now, I've not got a lot of use for a necktie, so my choice was take a garment that I had no use for whatsoever, or have no commemoration of that project at all. So I always took the tie, but obviously I've never worn it. I say obviously, I could have worn it, but I haven't. Finally, one project did actually manage to have a headscarf as an alternative. And I have to confess, I've worn the, neck, the, the headscarf as many times as I've worn the neckties. But you know, at least it was offered. But on the other hand, it's still marking out the difference. So, kind of not, not ideal, but, but better than the necktie. So, not so bad, you say. I mean, you know, it's kind of, it's just a tie and they let you have one. But kind of ask yourself, what if, what if it was a project lipstick? I mean, you know, it's sort of, yes, there's no reason why guys can't wear lipstick. They can wear lipstick. It's none of my business if they wear lipstick. It's not for me to judge. It's absolutely fine. It's, good. Well, it's, not, even right, it's not even fine to say it's fine. None of my business. But not many guys wear lipstick, and so with women wearing neckties. Okay, so this is land far away, long time ago, 1990s. And you say, yeah, Gail, this is the 21st century. It's moved on since then, right? Well, not entirely. I had an incident last year that was very, very similar to that, that I don't want to go into. I don't want to slag that one off. What I do want to do is praise PyCon UK for the glorious inclusivity of including left and right sock down here as a speaker gift. When I, he when I heard about that this morning, I thought, that's, yeah. Cheers, guys. That's, uh, it's, it's, that's, that's perfect. That's inclusive. There's no difference there. There is no gendered characteristics, well, I mean, maybe pink fluffy ones and, I don't know, My Little Pony ones and Hello Kitty ones or whatever, but, but socks basically are something, you know, all of us might well wear. I'm wearing some at this very moment. So, my advice, I'd like to suggest, because I went to a wonderful talk this morning about privilege and the importance of introspection in trying, if you're in a majority, trying to introspect. What I suggest, if you want to introspect when you're in the process of organising a gift or an incentive or an activity, anything like that for a mixed group, apply the sock test. And if you do that, hopefully you will enjoy the joy of socks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. Next up we have Samothy Barrett and she's going to tell us the story of a girl without docks. It's her first day. She arrives and, at nine and sits in her seat. The Python development job she's in for a treat. She turns to her manager, where can I get the code base? Oh, he says, it's hosted online on the Git server at 192.1.1268. She goes to log in but finds that she needs an account much distress. Oh, says the manager, that's fine, you'll need to make a request. When she finally gets in, the code on her machine, 
She goes to look for a readme, but it's nowhere to be seen. Uh, says a colleague, you'll need to speak to Tom. They know uh, everything. They wrote it. They'll take you through it, step by step, one by one. Upon speaking to Tom, they say, cool, but first, before you build it, you'll need the depths. They gave her a link and said, do a git fetch. When Tom goes to build it, they find that they can't. Uh -huh. They said, it's Windows 10, go speak to Ben. <laughs> ben gets the project to build, but it won't run. Mm, he says, you'll need DB access, I think. Speak to Rachel, she can do an account sync. When an account, uh, with an account already, she typed the command to go, but still nothing happened, nothing to show. She, clear, she checked her logs and with intense aversion, noticed that she needed an older Python version. <laughs> she ran it again and finally the script printed, okay. It works, she exclaimed, what a productive day. She prepared to leave her first day on the job, pleased that she got the first microservice working out of a hundred odd. <laughs> so the moral of this story, uh, don't just document your code, uh, please document everything around your code as well. Uh, newcomers come and they will need to be able to get everything working easily. Um, don't leave the knowledge with only one team member. Um, please, uh, you, you may know how to get it, um, how to get it working, uh, how to install it and everything you need, uh, but nobody else will unless you write it down and tell everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Sam. with me. If Ed Crew is in the room, could they please make themselves known to Peter, who's standing at the main door? Thank you. Is it going to work? So I can rub, but I can beatbox. Hey, there we go. Yeah, um, and this is Sean, and he's going to talk to us about how to save a life. How to save a life. It's a very bold topic. I'll just see if I can do it in five minutes. It's not a replacement for proper first aid training. Please do not tell everyone, oh, Sean's training in first aid. It's great. I can save lives. It's just a five-minute quick introduction. That's who I am. That's my Twitter handle. I never use Twitter. Um, so who am I, and why am I qualified to teach you to save a life? Well, I run a software development team. Nah. Uh, I volunteer with St. John Cymru Wells. Um, I have the role of emergency transport attendant, which means I get to drive one of these. That's my fantastic skill with Photoshop there. <laughs> On special occasions, I get to do that too. <laughs> We're a charity, we can't afford sirens. I'm also a first aid trainer. So, that is a typical human body. Now, I use typical because normal doesn't exist, especially not in medicine. Um, key parts of this, body is a unmanaged forest, to quote David. It's very good at being stable when it's not stable. There's some key bits you care about. Don't care about that, don't care about that, don't need that. Who needs a spleen? Right. <laughs> That's the bit we care about. So there's a bit of background. Here's your process. So we breathe in air that has oxygen. Oxygen goes into our lungs. Our heart pumps deoxygenated blood to our uh, lungs, that gaseous exchange occurs, we get oxygen, yay, oxygen goes to the brain, brain likes oxygen, brain doesn't have oxygen, brain's sad, brain dies. <laughs> Deoxygenated blood goes back to the heart, gets pumped to the lungs, carbon dioxide, we breathe out, we're fine, fantastic. When that goes wrong, there's a quick, well, there's not a quick way of fixing it, but there's a thing we can do to fix it, <laughs> maybe. So let's say you come across someone who's collapsed on the floor and in perfect first aid terms, they will always lie on their back because it's easiest to treat people on their back. There's a mnemonic. 
Dr. AB. You may have heard Dr. ABC, Doctors ABC. We're going to go Dr. AB today. So D stands for danger. Check for danger to yourself, to the casualty, to bystanders. Don't run into the middle of the road to someone lying in the road. That will get you killed as well. We don't like having more than one patient. Just one, please. <laughs> you're checking the patient for response. So you get, you're going to shout at them. You're going to give them a command, like open your eyes, and then you're going to shake them gently. Don't just whack them against the floor. They don't like that. <laughs> If they're not responding at this point, or they're only responding to pain, gentle, small bits of pain, um, shout for help if there's no one else around. And if you can, get an AD, automatic external defibrillator. I'm not going to cover that. I can't do that in five minutes. Um, so get someone to you, get them to stay with you, get them, or get an AD if you can. If not, or even then, carry on. You want to check their airways open. You need air. Air is good. Air has oxygen. So if they're lying on their back, you tilt their head back, and you open their mouth. And that will pull the tongue back away from the airway, which is great, because it makes it open. Then you want to check if they're breathing. Uh, so you put your ear next to their mouth, looking down their chest. You're looking for the rise and fall of the chest. You're listening for breath, and you're feeling for air against cheek. You do that for 10 seconds. If you don't feel any breath in that 10 seconds, they are not breathing. That is bad. Either way, don't panic. Call 999 or 911 or 112 or whatever is relevant to the country you're in at the time. They will ask you a number of questions. They will ask you, where are you? That's very important. They will ask you, what's happened? They will ask you, who's it happened to? Um, and they will usually ask you, is the casualty breathing? And they will tell you to start CPR. Um, if the casualty is breathing, that's fine. They'll probably still send someone to you. But this is the important bit, CPR. CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Key thing is, it's not really resuscitation. You're, you're helping keep them alive, but you're not going to bring them back, rarely. So it looks a bit like that, except if you see the bits, that's a problem. <laughs> So, to do CPR, you link your fingers, one hand on top of the other, doesn't matter which way around, so like that. You place the heel of your hand on the centre of their chest, on their sternum. Oh, I need to move the microphone a bit, there we go, so you can see me. Link your hands, centre of the chest, and you are pressing down hard and fast, about five to six centimetres, and keeping your elbows locked. So you're using your upper body strength to basically be their heart, and you're doing that kind of movement, that kind of thing. If you're doing that, you're not doing it properly, that's casualty CPR, we don't do casualty CPR. <laughs> You're aiming for about 100 to 120 beats a minute. There are some good pieces of music for this, like Staying Alive or Nelly the Elephant. There's also another one, Bites the Dust, but we don't tell people that. <laughs> Please don't sing. <laughs> if you're comfortable doing so, you give two rescue breaths every compression. So you give rescue breaths, you pinch the casualty's nose and form a seal around their mouth with yours and you breathe into their lungs. A lot of people aren't happy doing that. That's fine. Actually, studies show that not doing breaths for a bystander is better than doing breaths. You're looking at about a 10% to 35% resuscitation rate on doing CPR versus not doing CPR, in which case they're going to die. So, you know, 10% is better than death. To quote Daniela, children are like people but smaller. So you do smaller breaths because you don't want to damage their lungs. You start with five rescue breaths because it's likely that they will have collapsed because they've stopped breathing first. Um, you use one hand, not two. So one hand, that kind of movement. And then babies, they're like children but smaller. So you want to put something behind their shoulders to open their airway, like a towel or jacket, because they have really big heads. And just pushing that forward a bit opens their airway. Even smaller breaths, just the breath in your cheeks. Start with five rescue breaths. And you use two fingers, and you carry on until you're too tired to continue. Thank you very much. That's how to save a life. Thank you very much.
Uh, hello, this is Anne, and she is going to tell us how to make life a little better with chocolate brownies. Okay, so uh, my name's Anne. Um, this is the first time I've ever spoken at a conference, um, and I'm not going to talk about Python, but I'm heartened because lots of other people haven't. Um, I'm acting on two pieces of advice that... Um, I've had over the years. One is do something every day that scares you, and the other one is talk about what you know. Um, I'm absolutely terrified, but I do know about chocolate brownies, so <laughs> hence uh, that's what I'm going to do. So um, I cook. I cook at home. I'm an average cook. I cook to feed myself. I cook to feed my family. Um, but I just that is all I do. You know, I cook. Um, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's just the the need, it's just the basic physiological need. But I bake because I enjoy it. I bake because I like to do things, uh, I like to do that for me. I bake for my family, I bake for my friends, I bake birthday cakes. So that's my self actualization. Um, I bake lots of chocolate brownies. I've been baking chocolate brownies for about 20 years. I discovered a recipe about 20 years ago that I can make and I can make reliably. I use um, a Nigella Lawson recipe, I follow the instructions, and it comes out exactly as it says it should. It's not my skill, it's just the fact that I can follow the instructions. Um, it's a bit like code, I guess, in that respect. Um, I bake for any reason. I bake for my friends, I bake birthday cakes, I bake for dessert, I bake for charity. Um, recently, um, the last Comic Relief, I estimated that I had made 175 brownies in a week to sell for Comic Relief, so I do, I do brownies. Um, the, um, sorry, brownies behind. And my best ever performing business social media post had absolutely nothing at all to do with my business. It had to do with, it was in fact this post, it had to do with chocolate brownies and a wine box and we were going camping. So brownies are also <laughs> beneficial on that front, a good marketing tool. Um, the other kind of, I, I like a psychologist, I know I've already mentioned Maslow, um, the other psychologist that I like is uh, Winnicott. Um, my parenting goal, I have two children, my parenting goal has always been to be a good enough mother, and um, I don't always live up to that, but I at least try. Um, a couple of years ago, my kids were doing loads and loads of stuff over the summer, going off to camps and going to see various other people, and I decided that um, when you go somewhere new and you don't know anybody, a good way to break the ice is to have food. So we had brownies. So if you went anywhere in the summer of 2015 with either of my kids, you probably had brownies with you. Um, I have a reputation, for want of a better expression, amongst the air cadets um, and bar brownies brownies are a thing. Um, uh, and then the final thing I was going to say is I'm now at the stage of my life where my daughter is um, getting ready to leave home and I made her a book with kind of parental tips and advice and nice memories and things like that. There are two recipes in that book. One of those recipes is how to make chocolate brownies. So I'm hoping that I'm passing that knowledge and that information on to the next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. And you may notice in the corner our, our wonderful speech-to-text translators are uh, about to leave us. So could we have a big round of applause, please, from Morella and Cheryl. Hi, my name is Pavel and I'm a software engineer at Cloudify and up to about a year ago uh, my workday looked just like yours. It was full of distraction. I would uh, write a line of code, read an email, write a laser line and check up on Slack and so on. Uh, my productivity wasn't very high. Uh, it seemed that the more I tried to do, the less I actually accomplished at the end of the day. And there was a feeling of uh, unimportance to my work and even meaninglessness. And then I stumbled upon this fantastic this fantastic book, Deep Work, by the author, blogger, and uh, the P PhD in computer science, Carl Newport. And it taught me a lot of things, and I want to pass to you some of that knowledge today. Uh, so let's start with a definition. Uh, deep Work is a prolonged cognitive activity done in a state of uh, concentration without distractions. It creates new value, it is hard to replicate, and it uh, pushes our abilities to the, uh, to the limit. So. 
the first benefit of, uh, benefit of deep work is value. Uh, when I'm in the flow of deep work, I really feel like I'm generating genuine, meaningful value for my company. Because deep work is exactly the type of activity that is uh, pushing the company forward, that it requires the most uh, professional input from me that is hardest to replicate. But uh, paradoxically, we spend maybe 20% of our time doing such work. And so, but uh, time or attention are uh, really good proxies for importance and meaning because uh, our brain sees uh, the world through a, a lens of uh, attention and it assigns more value to tasks on which we spend more time and give more attention to. And this brings me to the second benefit of deep work, which is meaning. Uh, meaning that I've forgotten that, that I can derive from work, but I have rediscovered again uh, through deep work. Um, because a distracted day uh, or a shallow day is ultimately an unimportant and meaningless day. Well, if I've done deep work today, it means that at least some of the time I was deeply invested in something and my brain will col color this whole day as important and meaningful. Uh, the third benefit of deep work is that it allowed me to upgrade two of the core abilities in our line of work, which is the ability to learn new things, new hard things fast, and the ability to consistently perform at a high level. Uh, both of those abilities are critical in our field where we work with complex new technologies each day and uh, stick to tight deadlines, uh, and they're both completely dependent on our ability to do deep work. So uh, now that the benefits of deep work are uh, apparent to you, let's move on to the second part and see how we can apply those insights and learn a little bit uh, of, learn some tips. Uh, they're much more in the book, so I urge you all to read it. Uh, so uh, my main ad advice is don't take breaks from distractions, take breaks from concentration. So we all need to catch up on email or Slack sometime, but we don't have to let those distractions um, Never mind, next one. Uh, so uh, what I'm proposing is uh, whenever you're in front of a computer working, be in one of two states, either a state of concentration where you're doing deep work or a, straight, uh, a state of uh, rest or distraction where you're doing shallow work, but not both. So for example, when I work uh, lately, I, uh, when I'm in front of a computer, I start up a timer for about uh, an hour or so where I'm concentrated, I'm doing deep work, and I, I don't allow distractions and not even internet. Uh, why not? Because I improve as a programmer when I uh, solve something without stack overflow. I don't pay the heavy price of context switching when I'm jumping from app to app. And I like to uh, train myself to delay the gratification of uh, distractions. Because this muscle is so atrophied in us today that even a 20 second ride in an elevator is caused to pull up your phone lest you get bored, God forbid. So this training is very important for my ability to do deep work. So as I said, I set up a timer for about an hour, and then after it's done, I uh, set up a new timer, shorter one, for maybe 15 minutes, uh, in which I rest, check out my email, and do all the shallow necessary work. And this separation between shallow and deep work is exactly what allowed me to improve, because my productivity shoots up when I'm in the flow of deep work, and at the end of such a day, I really feel uh, a sense of meaning and satisfaction. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with the, um, the upcoming quote today to remind you that multitasking doesn't really work, so embrace simplicity, uh, embrace concentration, and embrace deep work. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, this is Tamarisk, who is going to talk to us about giving better talks. I 
I'd love to say I'd thought this through and actually sat there and um, rehearsed it. I haven't. So my apologies for that. I wrote this by accident based on the last few days. Um, there have been some really good speakers and there have also been some really interesting topics. Those two things have not necessarily collided. In fact, that's not true. The really good speakers that I've seen have also had really good topics. Anyway, there are three aspects to, pres to presenting. Talking to a room full of people. I'm terrified, by the way, just so you know. How you use your slides and the additional information you need to give afterwards. You will notice that my slides are quite bare. That's deliberate. Talking to a room full of people, slow down. If you normally talk really fast, slow it down. Talk slowly because the people at the back need to be able to understand what you're saying as well. Speak clearly or as clearly as you can while you're shaking. Use the microphone. There's a reason I'm not moving away. I don't want to project to you guys at the back. It's a really big room. Make people laugh. If you can. You don't have to. It's not a requirement. But if you've got a joke, put it in there. Don't read. Don't be, don't be there. That's not the story. You're fine. You were fine. Don't be there with your slides, reading everything off your slides. People want to be talked to, not... Um, if, you, if everything's on your slides, they can go away and read it. They don't have to have the presentation. Repeat yourself. Make sure that everything you say, you tell people you're saying it, you say it, and then you tell people you've said it. Just like writing an essay back when you were in uni or school. Don't worry too much about where you are. I've seen good presentations from people who are sitting down. I've seen people hiding behind the podium, like I'm doing right now. You could be out in the middle of the stage, but all anyone cares, you could be standing on your head as long as you're, as long as you're projecting your voice across the room. Okay, slides. Increase the font size. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. It's a bit silly. That's 16 points at the top, like most websites are. And right down here, we've got 128. You probably don't need to go that big. But yeah, if you, <laughs> if you only take one thing away from what I'm saying, increase your font size. <laughs> Seriously, is what you're showing necessary? It's really cool to do live coding. It's really cool to have a block of code on the screen so that you can see it. But if I can't see it at the back and I'm still listening to your talk, you didn't need that code on the screen. You could easily link it. Send me a GitHub, send me to your blog post, send me somewhere else. You don't have to have it on the screen. Don't forget accessibility. If you put everything in capitals, it's really hard to read. Make sure that your contrast is good so that people can read it really easily. Increase your font size <laughs> and have plainish backgrounds. It don't have to be as plain as mine are. I just went for, went for very, very plain deliberately. But you can have something in there, but don't make it really busy, otherwise people won't be able to read it. Additional information. Who you are. Where the audience can find you. If you're going to use short URLs, make sure they're actually short. I saw one earlier that was lovely. It was a lovely little bitly, bitly link, but the bit after the slash was about this long. That's no good. I can't type all of that in. If you've got information on your slides that you want people to get at, if you've got code that you'd like people to play with, and ideally write a blog post. All the stuff that you wanted to put on your slide in that big block of code, write a blog post about it. Then people can, people can go to it. How to contact you? On that note, this is who I am. I can be contacted on Twitter or I can be shouted at in person. <laughs> Thank you, Tamarisk. And our, our, our final speaker for the evening is, is, is a very special guest indeed. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Wright Sock, better known as Chloe. Not 
got a mouse. and split. Okay, now I've not got any of my notes, so I'm going to have to work with this. So, um, how PyCon UK changed my life, and it really did, in ways you can't, well, I imagine you can see it. So, if you ever did an event, say, such as me standing here as an example, looked at everyone and wondered, when can I leave? That's a lot of people, and I'm definitely feeling that right now, and <laughs> do I actually have to talk to anyone? So, at my first PyCon, I came in alone because none of my colleagues get tickets. And oh my God, I was terrified. Palm sweaty, shaking, bright red in the face, kind of wanting to hide in a corner and escape. And I went through three stages. The first was the fear, and um, it was a breakfast. I sat down, and um, I was on my own. I turned up nice and early. I got my bacon sandwich, because this was in Coventry and we had breakfast. And um, no one was there brilliant, you know, kind of sit with myself, don't have to be scared. And then someone sat with me and I kind of looked like a deer in headlights, frightened, don't know what to do, how to actually make conversation. And then they started it for me. And when I actually learned to talk to them, they asked me about, you know, what I did, the usual, the weather, how are you liking the conference when it just started? We, we had swag, it was great. And I got curious about it because this was a position I'd never been in. I never felt like I'd had the power to actually speak to people. It's, it was amazing. Well, yeah, I can't say that enough. I mean, everyone makes it so easy to talk to people, and it has changed how I do things. So I reached a stage of confidence. I, could, I can now call people on the phone that are strangers, which is great. My mum no longer has to make my doctor's appointments. <laughs> and... <laughs> It's just, say now, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen me on the registration desk. I'm capable of talking to you all rather than hiding underneath it and having a nap. It's just reaching that level of confidence. And while I was at, at PyCon, I think it was 15, I decided to register to become a committee member because after being there and learning so much, it changed me and it made everything so much easier. I thought, why not help? Because it's something that, if it's happened for me, it's got to have happened to so many other people, and it's to help make it happen. One of the main things, I guess, is to help you with my tips. Push your boundaries, but only do it in baby steps. Because, say, first conference, you're nervous, you come and stand up here, you're never going to want to do that again. It's just too scary. So if you're like, if you are in a position where you're nervous, just sit with someone. They probably will make casual conversation about the weather, about the last talk they went in. And you can make the next steps to be in a position where you can stand on a stage and talk to everyone, where you can run a registration desk, help people out, kind of be in a really nice position to kind of help all you wonderful people. And yeah, I want to say thank you, because you guys are the reason that I am in this position. So yeah, um, clap yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. Uh, and I think we have one, one further round of applause. We, we need to introduce Right Sock. On, on your feet, Right Sock. Left Sock, even. Left Sock. Hello, um, just quickly, um, uh, I've got two messages to pass on from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, firstly, they've been bowled over by the, uh, not just the number of people who've gone to help them at, uh, at the Pi Academy today, uh, but the quality of the help they've received. Uh, so they're really chuffed, so thank you. Uh, the second is that uh, uh, Tomorrow, we've got uh, a Code Club and a Raspberry Jam happening uh, in rooms B and C, which are down there. Uh, the room is not yet ready. Uh, at 6 o'clock, the night porters should have come and started to move some tables around, but the Raspberry Pi people are going to need uh, some hands to help set some other, uh, some other things up. Uh, so if, if, if you've got any time in the next 
uh, hour, perhaps, perhaps before the conference, the conference dinner starts. Uh, could you go and uh, give a hand? There are quite a few pe people here. I don't think they need all of you, so don't be offended uh, if they turn you away. Um, that's it for me. Anything from anybody else? Any? Owen's coming up the steps. There you go. I've got Daniele's list, so I'll be in trouble if I don't read it out. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the very good news, the, uh, the bar will be open in, well, I make it five minutes from now, so um, <laughs> the meal itself will begin at seven, so that's all downstairs where we've been having coffee, seven, I can't read my own writing, you're right, it's 7.30, so, but the bar is open at, in five minutes time, I got the important stuff right. Uh, if, if you are coming, please make sure that you have a ticket. Um, if you don't have a ticket, please don't bother turning up, but on the Slack channel you'll find a lot of discussion and a, and a pinned message on there with recommendations for other places you might like to go and eat. You don't need to bring a physical ticket? You don't need a physical ticket. We don't have physical tickets. We won't be policing it, but please turn, don't turn up if you haven't got a ticket. And finally, I hope you have a very pleasant evening. Before you leave us this evening, could you please take a quick look around uh, from here and on the way out, and uh, if you spot any litter or anything that needs picking up and putting it putting away, then please do so. I'm getting waved at from over here. I'm guessing you want volunteers? Volunteers for tomorrow? Nope. We could do with about 10 volunteers to shift some audiovisual equipment from here to somewhere else that I didn't catch. Uh, we'll be very quick about it and then we'll get down to the bar. Nobody else with an orange thingy is waving at me, so I reckon we've now got three or four minutes before the bar opens. Have a very good evening. <laughs> <laughs>